Before the Wright Brothers, The Adventures of Gustav Whitehead. An inventor by the name of Gustav Whitehead claims to have achieved flight in August of 1901. This claim predates the generally acknowledged first in-flight achievement of Orville and Wilbur Wright, December of 1903 by two years. But is it true? Did an immigrant inventor and a great storyteller who arrived in the United States in 1894 from Luthershausen, Bavaria, really fly first? It was in print, so it must be true. According to a few articles published at the time, and some printed years later, Gustav Whitehead and a few witnesses with their 30-year-old recollection of past events, well, he did. There is, however, no lack of dissent for Whitehead's claim. And, well, some claim Whitehead could be quite the storyteller. So, though he was an excellent engineer and mechanic, should his stories be believed? The short version of his claim to fame, gleaned from a 1935 article in Popular Aviation, goes thusly. Between 1901 and 1902, Gustav flew his number 21 contraption for a distance of one half mile in Connecticut. The flight path was claimed to have been along Pine Street in Bridgeport. The number 21 was designed with light, bad like wings, which were supported by lightweight ribs and cables. This first airplane was constructed mostly of wood with two engines. One engine to drive the wheels to get the aircraft up to speed and the second to drive the two propellers. It supposedly only flew once. The number 22 flying machine was claimed to have flown twice. The first flight was two miles and the second one was seven miles long. This device had one engine and was made primarily of metal. Its flight path was around the beach and sound in Bridgepool. Unfortunately, there is only one source for the 1935 popular aviation article this account came from. No photos and no other documentation. Just an interview with Gustav 30 years after the fact. Okay, but what about looking for something more concurrent with the events in question? Okay. Four days after the flight of the number 21, an article was published in over 80 papers, including the Boston Transcript and the New York Herald. But these articles are a bit suspect. The editors placed the story well behind the front pages in the sections that carried the human interest stories. At the time, there was a practice of printing unbelievable articles with fantastical claims in the regular legitimate newspapers. Later on in history, the job of sensational reporting was taken over by the tabloids, and now by the internet. But at the time, such articles sold papers. Some believe these particular reports may have been stretched a bit in an attempt to find big money investors for the project. Others consider them outright fantasy. And some just write them off as obvious lies, told to garner attention. But Gustav Whitehead was known to associate with aviation pioneers like Glenn Curtis, Samuel Langley, Adder, Maxim, and Herring. So he could be telling the truth or be just educated enough to know how to fabricate a story. <laughs> In the papers of the time, no claims of veracity were made except by the teller of the story, not by the journalist or the paper. And the reader was left to decide for themselves to believe the tale or not. Since then, historians have worked very hard to prove or discredit the claims of Gustav Whitehead, that he was truly first in flight, but there are a few diehard supporters who, like the Flat Earthers, will not be dissuaded in their belief. Are Gustav's claims legitimate? 
What is flight? Seems the argument comes down to three things. Number one, documentation, photos, immediate eyewitness accounts, and other physical evidence. The Wright brothers had these. Whitehead did not. Number two, models of the machines built in recent years. Well, Gustav's had to be re-engineered in order to work without falling apart and was flown into the air with a tow rope tied to a car. <laughs> like a kite. The Wright brothers, Kitty Hawk machine, when rebuilt years later, worked as designed. And number three, the important question of how flight is defined. For the experts, and the historians, there are questions, subtleties in the language of some of the accounts, and missing and changing detail in the accounts of the case of Gustav Whitehead. Did he hurdle his number 21 down Pine Street in Bridgeport, bouncing, thus getting into the air? Kind of. But not really self-sustained and controlled flight by a pilot. Was this flight? Did Whitehead get the number 22 airborne with the help of a tow rope and fly more like a kite? Or was it completely under its own power? And either way, was this flight? Did Gustav's achievements meet his own definition of successful, sustained, controlled, and independent flight, but not those of his doubters. If flying is defined as fully self-propelled, controlled, and continuous flight unbound from the earth, well, then it seems Gustav Whitehead probably didn't quite get there. Are his claims lies that he contrived complete fiction? The case could be made that they are, or are not. That they are just stretches of the truth, or colorful anecdotes. Some of his other designs actually did fly, like a hang glider, but that was a glider. Just as with many arguments, it comes down to semantics. How do you define it? What, for the purpose of being first in flight, does flight mean anyway? Well. Just as with any tale, there are many little ounce-sized nuggets of wisdom to be uncovered here. But for now, may I suggest just this one. Here's an ounce from our brief examination of the claims of Gustav Whitehead. It seems two points of view can seem to completely contradict each other. Meaning if one is true, the other must be false. Like, oh my gosh, that water is freezing cold. Oh, no, it's not. It's 33 degrees and still liquid, not freezing. But often it all comes down to definition, intent, how one expresses themselves. And granted, sometimes someone, and sometimes everyone, is just wrong or intentionally misleading or lying. But most of the time, if and when both sides of an argument are sincere, there is probably some truth in both, depending on how you decide to define it. <laughs> and that's it, an ounce submitted for your consideration. Well, thanks for watching. Appreciate it very much. Really do hope that you enjoyed this. Well, and I'm guessing you did if you watched it this far. And if you watched it this far, can you help us out? We'd really appreciate it. Would you please subscribe? Give us a like, share this with your friends. These kinds of things can help us to get out there into the YouTube sphere a little stronger so that others can enjoy us too. Thanks.